What's up, everybody? Rob here. So, for billions of people around the world, the Bible is a spiritual guide. But in addition to this, it is also a history book. And like history books everywhere, it is filled with conflict. This is a very brief look at biblical warfare. Now, a few disclaimers before I get started. First off, this is not comprehensive. The Bible is a massive work, and it covers thousands of years of history from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age and beyond. And covering everything is well beyond the scope of what I'm doing here. I'm just giving you a very generalized overview. Also, the Bible is much more concerned with spiritual matters and religious matters than with temporal and historical matters, particularly military history. And as such, the Bible is actually very sparse on detail. So as a result of that, it's actually very difficult for someone like me, who's basically just a hobbyist with this sort of thing, to go into extreme details anyway. Now, also, I'm going to be saying that I'm going to be looking at this purely from a historical standpoint and not a religious or spiritual one, which is the main point of the Bible. Um, obviously, it's a religious text. I'm going to be looking at, however, purely from a historical perspective, a, in this case, a military historical perspective. As such, please, please keep your fedora tipping to an absolute minimum. Okay, glad that we got that out of the way. All right, enough of the intro. Let's get down to this. So, military history in the Bible started with the conquest of the Holy Land, particularly noted in the book of Joshua, though there were some military conflicts beforehand. For example, Abraham had to go on a commando raid to rescue his nephew Lot, and Moses and the Exodus did have aspects of military campaigning to it. Now, during this time period, especially during the conquest of the Holy Land, the Israelites did not have a standing army, something that would continue through to the establishment of the monarchy under King Saul, and would later expand under King David and Solomon. Instead, the male population at large would be recruited on an ad hoc basis for a specific campaign along militia lines. As they were not an established kingdom, more sophisticated forms of warfare during the Bronze Age, for example, such as chariots, which was the mainstay of Bronze Age warfare from the more powerful neighbors, for example, the Egyptians, the Hittites, and others, uh, do not appear, at least not until the establishment of the Israelite kingdom. The typical Israelite soldier would be equipped with bronze, spear, or sword, with very little distinction in the patterns used by their neighbors. For example, as described in the book of Exodus, the, Israel, the Israelites left Egypt armed in an armed state, so it stands to reason that they were using the swords and other types of weaponry and equipment that were in use by the Egyptians at the time. They were in Egypt, they left armed, stands to reason they were using Egyptian-style equipment. Shields would often take the forms of wooden frames with leather stretched over them to offer a degree of protection. And for ranged combat, there was an emphasis on the use of the sling rather than upon the more sophisticated bow, which is a very convenient weapon for fending off wolves by shepherds, but also could be very effective against human enemies, as Goliath would find out a bit later. Now, the tribe of Benjamin was actually particularly noted as being skilled with this weapon, using the slings with their left hand. Why they were using their left hands, I honestly don't know. Now, equipment seems to be based both on the wealth and the personal inclination of who was using it rather than of any particular standard issue. The men would simply be called up for militia service. There would be a military crisis. They would gather men together with whatever equipment they seem to be able to, um, to scrape together. Wealthier individuals, individuals would have higher quality weapon, maybe a bronze helmet and um, other types of armor plating, though armor does not seem to be a major portion of the Israelite arsenal at this point, and they would simply go off and do whatever they have to do. They and they would often be used as a form of light infantry. Also, it's important to note that throughout the Bible, this is just a complete random thing, the Bible makes absolutely no mention of naval combat whatsoever. Make of that whatever you will. So the Israelites, at least during the reign of the judges and during the conquest of the Holy Land, seem to be militia based around a light infantry model. Now, according to the biblical narrative, the Israelites escaped Egypt armed. The Bible is actually in the book of Exodus is, is very clear, saying that they left armed. And they made their way into the promised land with a delay of 40 years. When you disobey God, he messes with your GPS. So as detailed in the book of Joshua, the Israelite forces swept into the land and captured large swaths of territory. Now, unfortunately for us military historians, the Bible is not too concerned with the overall play-by-play -play of what happened, but rather the spiritual element of the conquest, with victories being a sign of divine favor and defeats a sign of divine displeasure. If you obey God and do what he tells you to do, he rewards you with victory, 
if you don't do what he says, he, well, he sends his enemies to defeat you. This is actually a recurring theme throughout the entirety of the Bible. Still, some general patterns can be discerned that can be used by us military historians. The occupants of the Holy Land that the Israelites fought against were generally a settled people that lived within walled settlements. They had a much more sophisticated method of warfare, usually, but not always, centered around chariots, and also had armor and other equipments of superior quality than that of their Israelite foes. In addition to divine intervention, the Israelites would oftentimes use the topography to their advantage. Much of the land they captured, at least during these initial stages, as detailed in the book of Joshua and later on in the book of Judges, were the rough terrain of the highlands, and these were places that horses and chariots were less than useful. For example, the Judge Barak used a rainstorm, which actually bogged down chariots in the lowland while his men waited up in the hills, and while they were stuck in the mud, he swept over them, again with these light infantry tactics, getting in between the chariots and causing all kinds of havoc and defeating his enemy that way. There is also a great emphasis on ruses and deceit. For example, during the conquest of the town of Ai, Joshua did not have any of the complex siege equipment needed to take a walled town. To capture the town, he employed the most basic and also the most effective of tactics, the feigned flight. But this time, instead of using it with horse archers, as was famous with the Mongols, he did it with infantry. Now, he divided his force into two sections. The main force advanced on the town and began to siege the city. A second force waited in the hills behind the town, and after a short siege attempt, Joshua led his main force away from the city, apparently in retreat from the much superior garrison. Seeing this, the overconfident garrison of Ai threw open their gates and pursued the Israelites. Now, once they were clear from the city, Joshua used a series of signal torches on the hills around the city, and his second force emerged and descended on the now exposed army. Caught between the two forces, they were crushed in the pincer, and the now undefended town was soon taken. Now, Commonly, throughout this entire era, towns that would be captured in such a fashion would be put to the sword with none spared. Now, this is actually a very common practice at the time from everybody, and virtually every victorious army acted in the same way. It's incredibly inhumane by our standards today, but during that era, it was just simply a matter of course. It was simply something that literally everybody did, and honestly, the Assyrians did it way, way worse. Now, once the Israelites were settled in the region, the Israelites did have to con contend with various neighbors, including, but not limited to, the Canaanites, the Amorites, and especially, and most famously, the Philistines. This is detailed primarily throughout the Book of Judges. Once again, the Israelites relied heavily on the judges who acted as local militia leaders, gathering together men to deal with a specific threat, and then disbanding. So this was not a permanent standing army. Basically, they'd say something like, oh, the Amorites are attacking us. A judge would show up. He'd say, okay, you, 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 grab some weapons. Okay, meet me here. Okay, let's go deal with this. And then once that threat was dealt with, everybody would go back to doing whatever it is they were doing. So primarily, this was a malicious style force. Now, one of the biggest issues during this era was the Philistines' adoption of iron weapons, particularly iron chariots, as detailed in the book of Judges, chapter 1, verse 19. Now, they were heavily armored compared to their Israelite neighbors, using bronze scale armor in many cases, and the famous account of David against the Philistine champion Goliath mentioned that Goliath had greaves of bronze, a technology that is never mentioned being used by the Israelite forces up to that point. They are actually described as being very similar to the Mycenaean Greeks, who may or may not have been the famous sea peoples who had settled in the area, but that's a source of controversy. Some people say that some of the, um, that the Philistines were actually the sea peoples and that there's a tribe of them called the Peliset, Philistine Peliset. I, that's another controversy. I'm going to be doing a video on that eventually about the sea peoples, but that's another story for another day. In any case, such heavily armored forces... Uh, forced the Israelites to rely heavily, again, on these guerrilla tactics and these light infantry tactics, again, using terrain, as well as clever tactics and strategies to win, as opposed to just going force by force against them, because they simply could not contend with their foes who were superior in, these, in a technological fashion. There was also a very heavy use of psychological warfare. For example, the Judge Gideon surrounded at night an encampment of Philistines with torches concealed inside of clay jars. At a signal, they threw down the clay coverings, making a loud crashing noise, and the Israelites all around the camp shouted their battle cry. 
The sudden noise plus the sudden illumination of the now exposed torches frightened the Philistines who broke and ran in confusion, who were then cut down in their retreat, which is pretty much a typical pattern throughout history. Whenever an army starts to break and run, you break formation, you turn your back on the enemy, that's when you're likely to die. Now, throughout the era, iron weapons were being used in limited amounts, but bronze was still the material of choice, though over time, iron was becoming more and more common. Now, after the era of the Book of Judges, the Israelites coalesced into a single kingdom under the reign of King Saul, and later on under King David and his son, King Solomon. Now, it was here that the older style of militia using light infantry tactics gave way to a professional military force, much like that of their neighbors. A corps of charioteers, followed by both heavy and light infantry, as well as skirmishers, archers, and other specialist troops. Now, after King Solomon's death, a civil war would break out, and the kingdom would split between the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judea. Now, as the Bronze Age was giving way to the Iron Age, they were faced with new threats, especially that of Assyria, the superpower of the Near East, and I'm also going to definitely be doing a video on Assyria eventually and their military. But in any case, at the heart of Assyria's success was the most sophisticated military machine the ancient world has ever seen. They made very extensive use of iron weaponry, much more than any other force had in history up to that point, and were a professional force made up of full-time soldiers, with iron spears, iron swords, and iron armor. They also made use of the much more powerful composite bow, which hit much harder and had a longer range than bows that were already in use. Most importantly, however, they were experts at siege warfare, using a core of specialized siege engineers. They used tactics such as sappers to undermine the walls of a settlement, siege ladders, as well as ramps to climb over the wall, and other siege engines, including battering ramps to knock over gates and towers to overtake the walls while providing protection for those inside of it. Once they captured a settlement, the Assyrians were absolutely brutal, not only slaughtering the inhabitants and taking their stuff, which is pretty typical from everybody. The Israelites actually did that when they occupied the Holy Land to begin with, but also took great delight in torturing their victims, impaling them, and making pyramids out of their severed heads. Actually, in one relief from an Assyrian palace, the king and the queen were relaxing in a garden with the severed head of a former foe dangling above them. It was there just as a decoration. Now, over the next few centuries, the Assyrians would capture and subjugate the kingdom of Israel and would greatly weaken the kingdom of Judea. Judea would hold on for a little while longer, but then would eventually be captured by the kingdom of Babylon, leading to the famous deportation of Babylon. And the Holy Land would at that point go through a number of successors, including but not limited to the Babylonians, the Persians, the Macedonians under Alexander the Great, Seleucids. There was a brief period of Jewish independence, and uh, by the way, happy belated Hanukkah to any Jewish viewers of this. In any case, the Romans, the Abbasids, the Crusaders, the Ottomans, the British occupation, and now an independent state of Israel. But those are all different stories for different days. But in any case, those are different stories for different days. In any event, I covered pretty much everything I want to cover here. Just a very brief overview as to warfare and how it was conducted in the Bible. Just a very brief, concise um, starting point for people who aren't particularly familiar with the subject. In any case, that is it for this video. Please hit the like and subscribe button. More videos coming out whenever I get around to it. Have a good day. Or don't have a good day. Your adults have any kind of day you want. See you later.